Let's dive deeper about how therapists can use different specific tools and interventions within the HACT Acceptance Commitment Therapy framework to help clients. If you haven't already, you should check out my other video about an ACT overview that talks about the philosophy and key principles of ACT. But this video goes into more depth about some of the different ways you might approach these concepts with clients. And the idea here is that you have to actually practice these things in order to fully learn them yourselves. In the book, The Happiness Trap, they talk about this example of the difference between reading a travel book about India versus actually going to India. I also think of it as like the difference between watching a video on YouTube about riding a bike versus actually pedaling yourself. And so a lot of the tools and exercises that I'll be sharing here, I encourage you if you haven't already to try them yourselves before you try them with clients as well so that you really know them. When you set up a standard structured uh, session with a client, it usually follows this format if you're in the ACT mind frame and mindset. So first you just do a general check-in. You know, how have things been since last time? This might be a good time to do a simple one to 10 assessment of how are you feeling? And you don't want to rush them along. You wanna be able to fully check in but also letting them know early on, probably in your first session, that this is a time just to kind of check in. If anything major has happened, you can talk about that, but otherwise it's just a, a brief check-in before you actually get into discussing any issues um, from the week later on. You want to review the homework, hopefully earlier in the session if possible. And so that could be something that they were working on, they wanted to uh, read about or explore or try in the last um, week or so since you saw them. So having that accountability and checking in on how did that thing go and seeing how that was. Then you agree to your plan for the session. That doesn't mean you have to say, okay, what's our agenda today and make it like a business meeting. It's usually more natural, like what should our focus be today or what, how can I be useful to you? in today's session, something like that to kind of get an idea of what are we doing? What are we working on? And you can certainly have some things in your back pocket that you could work with, but often they'll come wanting to discuss, you know, debrief something that has happened since you last saw them or working you know, on one of their goals that you already had established. And then you actually do it. You do the thing uh, in your session, maybe uh, an exercise of some Point, certainly talking and then you agree on homework notice I didn't say a sign this should be something that flows naturally it's something relevant probably something that you already discussed during the session that came up when you were working the agenda and it's just a matter of repeating that that's something that they'll be working on for the next time and summarizing everything that you did and covered and potentially also getting some feedback on the next session. This could be, um, you know, it's just, just as simple as how are you feeling now or what was most helpful to you today? This is not about getting a pat on the back for being the world's best therapist, but rather an idea of how they're feeling as you're leaving and anything that you might adjust for the future. So moving towards those six principles of psychological flexibility, the first being acceptance, obviously a key component of acceptance and commitment therapy. This is the idea of trying to make room for our thoughts and feelings instead of trying to change them. Realizing that both good and bad emotions are a part of life, that our default state is not blissful sunshine and rainbows all the time, but that it is a normal, albeit sometime un sometimes unpleasant, part of the human experience to have ups and downs. And so not passive resignation, but making room for kind of expansion of that acceptance. One of my favorite analogies that I like to give with clients related to explaining the concept of acceptance comes from the happiness trap. And I'm gonna read a direct quote here. It says on page 60 um, from Russ Harris, it says, imagine you're wanting to get rid of something. <clears throat> wanting to get rid of something is quite different than actively struggling with it. For example, suppose you have an old car that you no longer want, and suppose you won't have an opportunity to sell it for at least another month. 
You want to get rid of the car, but you can simultaneously accept that you still have the car. You don't have to try to smash the car up or get drunk every night because you still have the car. So this idea of you can have something that you don't really want, you can want to get rid of it, but at the same time, you can accept that for now, you do have it and that you hope to get rid of it in the future, but this is the way it is for now and that that's something that is okay. Now, I mentioned this in, in the other video with the ACT overview, but it's really important here to think about considering um, <clears throat> how to frame this with specific issues. For example, if someone was assaulted or experienced some form of discrimination, we don't want to in any way come across as being insensitive of just saying, oh, well, that's life. Just you got to accept it. You can certainly still advocate for social justice. You can seek justice in righting wrongs and you can show empathy um, when someone is experiencing bad things. But there are some times that you can't always change your circumstances. And so that's where the acceptance of the feelings and thoughts can come into play, kind of contra to a more cognitive therapy approach where you're trying to change or reframe those thoughts. Another helpful analogy is your classic quickstand. Instead of saying, I don't want to feel this way, you could say, I don't like this feeling, but I have room for it. The idea is that when you're in quicksand, if you're struggling and thrashing about, you're going to sink deeper, faster. But if you just relax and float yourself up, you're going to be safer and not sucked into the quicksand. And that is one way that sometimes ACT is explained. The last analogy that you can give clients is a snow globe. The idea that, you know, sometimes there's things in life that shake us up and we've got our, our snow just flying all around us. And if we're trying to do more, we might just keep shaking it. And that just by chilling, being mindful, being acceptance, and just plugging along with a values congruent life, that will help kind of settle some of those flakes that are whirling about. The next part here that I'm going to talk about is contact with the present moment. This is that sort of mindfulness, be here now piece. Russ Harris defines it as consciously bringing awareness to your here and now experience with openness, receptiveness, and interest. Some more analogies you can use with clients. One is that it's like an anchor. An anchor is not going to change the fact that a storm is happening, but it will keep you grounded. It's not going to keep you absolutely perfectly still with no movement or variability at all, but it's going to keep you within a safe range and going to keep you here even when the winds are blowing you to and fro. So mindfulness can make you feel better. It can make you feel more present. But the idea is just that non-judgmental acceptance and awareness of the present moment keeping you here rather than thinking about the past or the future all the time. There are many different exercises you can do with clients related to mindfulness and going into each of these in detail is probably beyond the scope of this video, maybe another video, but some of my favorites are body scans. So a body scan is basically starting usually from the top of your head all the way down to your toes, and you're just noticing. You're noticing the way your hair feels on your scalp. You're noticing your eyebrows and your forehead. You're noticing your eyes and so on down the line, and just noticing and paying attention to each part of your body, which is a little bit different than a progressive muscle relaxation where you're doing something similar, but at each stage you're like tensing, and relaxing, you know, you're shrugging your shoulders and then you're, you know, kind of unclenching, right? And so one is more noticing and one is an active tensing and releasing of energy. Box breathing is one where you kind of either imagine or actually see a box and you kind of breathe in on one line, hold on the next line, out on the next line, hold, in, hold, out, hold. I personally like rectangle breathing better, 
And I think that that can also be helpful for someone with uh, trauma, like survivors of torture or something like that. The, the holding of the breath can be a bit distressing if you haven't practiced it. So I think of it more as a rectangle of breathing where it's a longer uh, inhale, a short hold, a longer exhale, and a short hold again. Diaphragmatic breathing, especially if you're working with kids, you know, imagining a balloon or something to really, um, you know, have your hand. Sometimes I'll have um, clients put a hand on their chest and a hand on their stomach and breathe and see, did your chest move more or did your stomach move more? And trying to move that breath into the stomach so that we're really taking those deep belly balloon breaths, fully breathing and not just shallowly out of our chest. Mindful eating, the classic example is eating a raisin. So you look at it in your hand and you um, look at the colors and the textures, you feel the, the ridges and textures, maybe you smell it, you feel the weight of it in your palm, and then you know you pick it up, you, you eat it, like it's this whole <laughs> sensory experience of mindfully eating, but of course you can mindfully eat anything, not just raisins. You can mindfully do anything, actually. That's why I have everyday activities here. Some really common ones I have clients do are mindfully doing the dishes, mindfully driving, um, mindfully walking. So it doesn't have to be sitting still and meditating. It can be doing something and just being fully present and noticing all of those sensations, noticing what are you hearing, seeing, smelling, feeling, tasting. Loving kindness meditation. There's a lot of those uh, scripts and videos online to guide you through how to do a loving kindness meditation, but in essence, it's sending good positive thoughts and care and love mentally to yourself, to others. Uh, it could be someone that you care about and then someone maybe you don't care for as much. It can be a broader community or society. So kind of that, that loving, uh, energy thoughts. I, I do this while I'm in rush hour sometimes. It's very helpful. And the curious scientist of imagining that you are a scientist studying an alien species and looking at, oh, what is this? And kind of having that fresh beginner's mind about what you're experiencing and seeing and thinking as well. Now, values is a really large part of ACT as well. We want to identify our values and then take action to live in line with them. Here's just a selection of example values. There are many more than this, and you can find some great lists online of, of example values, which can be a helpful starting place for your clients if they're not really sure exactly where to start or what some are. You can give them a list and they can circle the top few that resonate the most with them. So I want to say here with values that we don't want to get caught up so much in definitions. Technically, values are present focused. They are more permanent than a goal. They are not personality traits, but I don't want to get legalistic about this. If it's good enough to help you live a meaningful life and guide your actions towards a meaningful values congruent life, then that's good enough for me. This is not a grammar exercise. Okay, This is meant to be helpful. So the key is whether this is something that you can actively pursue. Your values should be your own and not imposed by somebody else. And there shouldn't be shame in those values either. For example, if someone actually values achievement and autonomy, they shouldn't pretend that they actually value faith the most when they actually don't. This, in order to be congruent, they have to be your actual values and that's okay and we accept that. Here are some questions that I often use to guide value identification. What do you care about the most? What matters to you? What do you stand for? If you were free to choose anything, what would you do? You know, if you won the lottery, what would you spend your time doing? Would it be going on adventures? Would it be spending connection with family? Would it be pursuing some um, learning opportunity, right? That kind of guides what, what's valued. What has guided your life direction thus far? Or what do you want to guide your life direction in the future? Imagine two of your closest friends are talking about you. What would you want them to say about you? What personal strengths or qualities do you have or do you want? And what do you want people to say about you at the end of life in your eulogy? So this is a great example of something that you can give as homework, maybe as journal prompts to these questions. It's also really great to 
have a discussion with a partner or family or friend about these values? What values do they see in you? Because oftentimes that objective outside perspective is going to help you see what you're actually pursuing right now as your values. What do you care about? A question here is what if someone is already acting in line with their values and they're still not happy? Well, I have two things to say about that. One is that it's possible that they're not being fully present or mindful in it. Maybe they're caught up in a checking off the to-do list mindset rather than a I get to do this mindset and not connecting that, yeah, this really does matter to me and having that frame on it. As a social worker, I think the other element here is that this is just one piece of the puzzle. Happiness and satisfaction and meaning are extremely complex. So if we find our true values and we live in a way that is aligned with them, we take actions to abide by those values, that's not going to be a silver bullet that is going to magically you know, be a magic wand to fix your life and make you never have a bad day again. But rather, it's just one element of hopefully many tools and elements that you use to guide your life decisions and hopefully make you feel better. Although, as we know, symptom reduction is not the main goal, but usually just a positive after effective act. I really like this act bullseye as well. So sometimes when I'm helping clients do goals, I'll have them make their life into a pie chart. And you might have work or education, you might have romantic relationships, friendships, family, intellectual pursuits, physical health, fun and leisure, spirituality, etc. And they make goals in each of those areas. Well, similarly, you can see how aligned your living is with your values in each of these areas because depending on what your focus is people might just be thinking about their values related to relationships and family or they might just be thinking about values in in their workplace but of course we are more uh, we are complex people and it's important to have balance in each of those areas and to have uh, congruent actions that help us to lead a balanced life so you want to kind of see in each area, are you living by your values? And some areas you might be really strong and others might be weaker. Like maybe you are working a lot and you value achievement and you're able to find success and recognition or whatever in the workplace or with your schooling. But then that means that you don't have as much time for leisure and adventure and fun that you want to do. Or maybe you are um, very invested in, in caregiving, helping a, a, a relative, and you value service and connection. And so that's really strong, but maybe you've neglected your own physical health or your spiritual or intellectual growth goals and values. So having an idea of where you fall in each of these areas so that you can be mindful that it's not just a value, but it's also values in different realms of your identity and your life. A question that I often get is, well, what happens if values conflict? So to take uh, a few examples here, maybe you value both achievement and leisure. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. And I would argue that a balanced life includes both of these things, that they are not at odds and that to pursue one in expense of the other is a problem, no matter which direction it goes. But if there's truly a conflict, you could look at ranking values to see what is most important to you, because most of the values that you see on these lists, we all value, right? Who's going to come back up here and say, actually, I don't value uh, creativity or determination or connection or autonomy or harmony, right? Most of us have some degree of affinity for all of these things. But seeing what is the most resonant to you and your identity. You can also look at alternatives. You know, are there other ways of pursuing this? So, for example, love versus loyalty. Take the example um, from this guy here from the movie Love Actually, who's in love with his best friend's wife. So he val maybe values loyalty to the friend on one hand and also wants to pursue love and those can't really exist. 
So maybe it's a matter of finding, you know, which values mean the most to you long term and focusing on those, finding other ways to pursue it. So you can you can value love and find love in non-romantic ways or maybe with a, a different romantic target. OK, um, figuring out another way to kind of channel or, or get value out of that if one of if it's unrequited. Um, also balancing, you know, focusing on one now and another later. So right now I'm going to focus on loyalty and then down the line, it'll be my chance for love. As long as you do get around to doing that later and looking at you know some other tools as well. So these are just some things to keep in mind with troubleshooting as values identification comes up. Next up, we have diffusion. Diffusing our observing self, our thinking self, realizing that there might be a lot of content going on in between my eyes, you know, or in between my ears, behind my eyes of things that I'm hearing or seeing, whether that be outside stimuli or my own thoughts and feelings. But that's not me. Those are the passing clouds to my blue sky identity that is myself. That's emotional weather. So one tool for diffusion that I found to be a helpful analogy is a wildlife photographer. So you're kind of like not just the photographer, but the camera itself. You're like a camera where you're just watching. You're not involved. You're not feeling threatened. You're not at risk. You're just a camera, right? Thoughts, feelings, they can't harm you. They can't do anything to you. But you are simply observing and watching them. Another way to think about diffusion is thinking through what story is your mind telling you and how helpful is that story? If you think about your thoughts, you know, you might write them down in a journal and they become words. Words are really just little black marks on a page. They can't hurt you. And so thinking about thoughts as stories and sometimes they're true stories, we call those facts. Sometimes they're actually not true stories that we tell ourselves. I'm the worst, right? And so people in a cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral framework would probably agree with this. What's the story? How helpful is it? And then in that framework, they would reframe or try to, to change that thought. Thoughts are not orders. We don't have to obey them. Thoughts may not be wise. We don't automatically have to follow their advice. And thoughts are not threats, even the most painful or disturbing ones. This is from the ACT mindset. Okay, now certainly let's think critically about this, particularly if you think about flashbacks, trauma, PTSD. I know that there's people out there that would disagree with the statement that thoughts are not threats, but trying to frame it this way can make them feel a lot less threatening, actually. You know, just because I'm having a memory of a time that someone was mad at me doesn't mean that there's any threat now to me as a person. Negative thoughts themselves are not the problem, as in CBT, but if we fuse to them, that's the problem. So that's the key distinction here. With CBT, we might be saying, hey, this is an unhelpful thought. That in and of itself is a problem and we need to change it. Whereas in more of an ACT framework, we might say, okay, I'm having this thought, I'm observing it. It's okay that I'm having negative feelings as long as that doesn't become who I am and fused with my identity, that I have a separate observing self from my thinking self. You can also defuse from positive thoughts if they are unhelpful. So thinking about, for example, maybe someone who's having a manic episode, maybe there's some particularly grandiose uh, thoughts, or maybe someone with a narcissistic personality disorder. So within a range, you know, too positive of thoughts can also be problematic for our life outcomes. And so diffusion in that sense can be helpful too. Some good metaphors for diffusion here. Uh, one would be uh, naming the, the thought or story. So a picturing that your thoughts are like a, a radio station and you're you're calling it you know station doom and gloom or something like that oh that's the radio station playing again and the the radio is kind of going you can choose whether you're listening to it or not but if you kind of name it 
and think of it as something separate, like a kind of separate part of you, that can be helpful. One that I really like is a car driving by the house. So you are the house, your thoughts are the cars. And maybe there's a really obnoxious car that's got a loud subwoofer and no muffler and it's, you know, banging on by your house. Yeah, we've got those obnoxious thoughts too, right? But we don't have to let the car into the house. It's just passing by outside and we are safe and secure in our house, even if that thought is really loud, really obnoxious, really ugly. And then a final one would be waves on a beach. As you can imagine, the idea that waves come and go, they might crash, they might be strong, they might be gentle, but the beach kind of remains even as the waves come and go. And so the beach is like your um, observing self and the waves are like your thinking self or your thoughts that are coming through. A really helpful exercise is just adding this simple sentence stem to the beginning of a thought. I am having the thought that, or I am experiencing. So say you wake up and you're feeling really unmotivated. You don't, you don't want to go to work. Instead of saying I'm unmotivated, you could say I'm experiencing a lack of motivation right now. That feels so much more temporary, right? Or I'm having the thought that. I'm having the thought that I'm boring. Instead of saying I'm boring, I'm having the thought that I'm boring. Okay, so it's not so much about the label, but it is about I'm having this experience of a thought. It makes it feel a lot less threatening and also helps you to see that it might not always be true. I love corny, cheesy, silly stuff. So I love the, um, the advice with ACT to basically get silly. Um, I already mentioned naming the station. Um, so, you know, you've got your radio doom and gloom or whatever you have broadcasting and you can just kind of remind yourself of that chuckle a little bit. It's no big deal. Um, you can give your thoughts a silly voice. <laughs> so imagine, you know, your most difficult, painful thought that you're having, maybe a critique of yourself. If you say it in like a really silly voice, like it really seems way less <laughs> scary, hurtful. If you imagine giving a ridiculous voice to your negative thoughts, you can also give it a tune. So imagine, you know, your darkest thoughts to the tune of Jingle Bells or Happy Birthday. Doesn't really seem quite as dark when you do that. So, um, you know, you're not necessarily challenging the thoughts here, but you're sort of separating yourself from them. You're observing them. And it, it's an important to note here that you are doing these things with clients, not for them or to them. There needs to be some buy-in. There needs to be some collaboration here. So I would never, for example, if a client, you know, said that they felt like um, they were ugly, I would never say like, you're ugly, you're ugly. Like, I'm not gonna like do something like that. Um, but it needs to work for them. So it's this idea of collaborative empiricism where the therapist and the client are working together as collaborators to try some different tools and find out what works for you. If this is works, great. If not, no big deal. We try the next tool. One of my absolute favorites that I use a lot personally is thanks mind, thanks brain, and we can move on. The brain is an amazing machine. It's an amazing tool. Um, from an evolutionary perspective, it makes perfect sense. It's always trying to help us survive. It's trying to help us learn from our mistakes in the past and to plan for the future. But sometimes your brain is just too good at what it does. It's a bit of an overachiever and it keeps trying to help you when you don't need the help. You've already figured out your plan for the future. You've already solved that problem in the past. You've already processed it, but it keeps going over and over. And so instead of beating myself up for that, if it's something maybe I'm dwelling on from the past that I'm embarrassed about or wish I had done differently, I'll say, thanks, mind. You know, thanks, thanks for helping me avoid repeating that past mistake. I have learned that lesson and I know, you know, what I would do differently. So we can move on from that now. Or if I'm constantly thinking about what's going to happen in the future, 
hey, brain, you know, thank you for helping me prepare. I've got a plan. I've got it written down. I've, you know, figured out what I'm going to do. And now I can go back to being focused in the present moment, back to that mindfulness. So just tell your brain, yeah, I've received the message. Thank you. I know you're trying to help me survive. I am surviving and thriving. You can go on standby and take your break. And let's focus on the here and now. You can also think of your thoughts as images, not just words, but pictures, right? I often think in pictures instead of just words. And so the caveat here is that you don't want to do this for a traumatic or really high intensity painful memory, but something kind of more moderate, you can imagine it as an image. So say um, you're upset about a conflict that you had with your partner. Um, and it's you know getting you all angry, you know, thinking about it. You can imagine putting that scene on a television screen. Speed it up so they're not gonna really fast. Slow it down. We're talking really slow. Add a musical soundtrack. Uh, change the green screen. So instead of you know an office scene behind you, you've got a beach scene, or you've got like some elephants at the zoo or something ridiculous. So again, these are kind of on that silly spectrum, but it's the idea that you are not your thoughts. Your image, your, your thought can be an image that's outside of you, but it's not who you are and your identity. Moving on to um, self as context, I mentioned this previously, but I want to give it in more detail here is the, the blue sky analogy. You're the sky, your thoughts are the weather. It can be good, light, wispy, beautiful, heart shaped clouds. It can be dark, stormy thunderclouds that cover the whole sky at times, but the sky is still there. That's the thinking self, the clouds, versus the observing self, the sky, our true identity. Weather changes, naturally. There's some streaks where you might even have totally clear days, but the sky is not defective when clouds roll through. The sky is still the sky. There's nothing wrong with it based on the emotional weather that is coming through. There might be some really dark, weather, there might be a tornado, but it doesn't threaten the sky. Committed action. Let's do it. We've got our values. We're going to commit and act. So what will help you be the person you want to be? How do you actually get out there on the field and do it? And these should be values driven, not avoidance driven. We are doing something because it is meaningful and going to help us lead a richer life, maybe enjoyable as well, not because it's the best alternative to running from something unpleasant. Get in action, let's just do it. Let's do the damn thing and stop talking about our values and we're actually going to take action. So you wanna first look at what do you value and then operationalize it. What does it look like? What's one thing you can do this week that would represent your pursuit of that value. These goals should be short, medium, and long-term. There's things that I could do today, but there's also things I need to be thinking about long-term to reach that goal. In the happiness trap, there is a reframe of SMART goals, and they actually call it specific, meaningful, adaptive, realistic, and timed. So having very specific goals. One of my favorite things to note here is to avoid dead person goals. You might say, what the heck is a dead person goal? A dead person goal is something that you could easily achieve while you're dead and that someone who's dead could do that better than you could. So a great example of a dead person goal is to never get angry, to stop worrying. Okay, uh, a corpse can do that, but can humans always, always, always stop worrying? You can probably do a lot of things to reduce that worry, but you can accept that some worry might creep in because you're not dead. The willingness and action plan. Um, so this is basically a step-by-step -step way to go through the whole process. You know, my goal is the values that underline that goal are the thoughts, feelings, sensations, and urges that I'm willing to have in order to achieve this goal are. That's where you think about, I might be willing to step outside my comfort zone, feel a bit uncomfortable to pursue these goals and values. It would be useful to remind myself that 
any change won't happen overnight, something like that. I can break this goal down into smaller steps, such as the smallest, easiest step I can begin with is little victories are so helpful. Get the ball rolling. Get rid of that inertia. The time, day, and date that I will take that first step is making that specific plan. But a lot of clients avoid action because of fear, which stands for fusion with negative thoughts, excessive goals or things that are too daunting, that it's paralyzing, avoidance of discomfort, or remoteness, being removed, not in touch with your values. So to combat fear, we can dare, no, not dare like drug abuse resistance education, but DARE stands for defusion, acceptance of discomfort, realistic goals, and embracing your values. Now, my last slide here would not be complete without explaining to you the very classic metaphor of ACT, which is passengers on the bus or demons on the boat. I'm going to paraphrase here, but the way I might explain demons on the boat in a short way would be imagine that you are on a ship, you're sailing and you see the shoreline in front of you. That's the life you wanna live. That's the values congruent life that you're aiming for, that you'd like to go towards. But there's these little demon creatures with sharp teeth and fangs and claws that live under the boat. And if you're just aimlessly drifting out to sea, they take a nap down below. But as soon as they hear the rudder going, and they see you know, the engine going full speed ahead for the shore, the demons come up and they try to scare you. And what's important to keep in mind is that those demons, they're not going to touch you. So the demons are like your thoughts and they might come and look kind of scary, but they're actually not gonna harm you and you just need to ignore them as you go in pursuit of your committed action towards your values. Hope this was a helpful overview for yourself personally and professionally.